Well, good morning, Hickory Ridge family. And welcome to the continuation of a series we began a few weeks ago entitled Transformed, where we've been taking a look at how to win in our thought life. And our time together has taken us throughout the Bible, but predominantly with the words of the Apostle Paul, who shared his own struggle between the thoughts he wanted to have and oftentimes the thoughts he did have, but also the encouragement from Paul to the churches that, by God's grace, he was able to birth on how to win uh, this battle. And Paul offered encouragement like this in Romans uh, 12 too, where he said, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God, let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way that you think. And then you will know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so we started our time a couple weeks ago with Uh, that question of what are we thinking? Not the weight of the past, not the burdens of hurt and trauma and pain that oftentimes we allow ourselves to stay in, but what are we thinking right now, today? God wants to do a work in us. He wants to make rivers in our desert and paths in our wilderness. He doesn't want us to miss it. So it's important to carve out that elbow room and ask ourselves today, What are we thinking? Are our thoughts predominantly through the pain around us or the pain from our past? Or do we see our world predominantly through the light that's within us? And we took a look at this idea that our thoughts impact our emotions. And out of the overflow of our emotions come our words and our actions. And from our words and our actions come consequences that none of us can escape for the good or for the bad. All of us have consequences in our life. And Paul's saying to us that if we want the consequences, the future, the direction of our life to be good and pleasing and perfect, then it starts foundationally, right here at the bottom, with what's happening between our ears. So it stood to reason that if God wants to transform us into new people, he tells us how he wants to do it, by changing the way that we think. He must have given us an ability to change it, to train our brain. And that's where we settled last week. And the idea of, uh, I shared some of my own uh, evolution of my thoughts from popcorn popping and thinking of everything all the time to boxes with lids that I could still control when they opened and when they closed until I realized I couldn't control when they opened or closed. And now, instead, I come with delight and joyfully to the Lord. Uh, and, And I talked about meditation, right? frequent and focused and fixed, our thoughts towards God and our prayer time towards God. I'm appreciative of the, some of the great feedback that we've gotten from this series, and, and uh, particularly with including science in it. I think in order to change and train our brain and change the way we think, we have to have a better understanding of how our brains work. Uh, so you recall we took a look at one of the neuroscientists, Dr. Greg Gage, and a pretty cool experiment, scientific experiment that he conducted that had some pretty cool spiritual implications. I want to just highlight another neuroscientist I've been researching and following uh, for this series, and his name is Dr. Michael Merzenich, and he's a neuroscientist. He's actually considered a pioneer in the field of neuroscience uh, for several decades. He is responsible for findings indicating that brain exercises may be just as useful and just as helpful as drugs in addressing serious conditions, even as serious as schizophrenia, that plasticity, what we're talking about here, that our brains are dynamic, they're not static. Neuroplasticity uh, exists really from cradle to grave. And that radical improvements in our cognitive functioning, how we think, uh, how we learn, how we perceive, how we remember, are possible even into our elderly years. And one of the landmark experiments that Dr. Mersenich uh, conducted in the 1970s, and again, back then, it's surprising to me, it may be surprising to you, that back then the prevailing thought process was that our brains were fixed. After about adolescence, our brains were ostensibly fixed, that the different parts of our brain that controlled different functions, if there was damage to one of those parts, those functions were forever lost. And Dr. Merzenich set out in a landmark experiment in the 1970s to confirm this. That's what he thought. But his experiments actually proved the exact opposite. 
that skills previously learned by damaged tissue, uh, based upon his findings, um, could be relearned in other parts of the brain. Thanks chiefly in part to Dr. Mersenich, we now know that the brain is one big learning tissue. I shared some changes last week in my own thought process. And uh, I did it for several reasons, not least of which is because if, if I hadn't undergone that change, if God didn't change my thought process to what it is today, I more than likely would not be a pastor today. It's that important. It's that critical. Um, I learned through some painful experience that often, oftentimes God delivers good things through hard things. And I want that to be an encouragement to you. In the, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I say these things to you so that in me you may have peace. Peace that transcends your understanding. Peace that may belie your circumstances. Peace that is greater and deeper and higher and better than the weight of the pain and the trauma and the heartbreak that you've experienced and that thus far you may be walking under that identity umbrella that says, this is the loudest voice I'm hearing. In me, Jesus says, you have peace. In the world, you're going to have trouble. But in me, you're going to have peace. Fear not, for I have overcome the world. So our brains are not static. They are dynamic. And we can train them. Whether we train them, whether we fight through, they're bigger than us, they're stronger than us, we're grasshoppers, can't be done, they're giants. Whether we stay outside of God's promise or we fight through, the truth is the same for all of us. And that truth is this. The life you have is a reflection of the thoughts that you think, for better or for worse. It is an indelible truth that none of us can escape. Your life will move in the direction of your strongest thoughts. The life we have is a reflection of the thoughts that we think. So, God wants to transform us. He tells us how he wants to do it, by changing the way that we think. He gives us opportunities, yes, but he gives us an ability to actually change. Then the next logical question in the sequence is, change towards what? And that's where we're going to settle today. Today's sermon I've entitled, God Thoughts. God Thoughts. Now, before we jump in, just a a word of caution as one of your pastors. I'll sleep better tonight if I say this. Many of you know this. Some of you are living it, but I'll feel better if if I say it. One of the unique things that God gives to us is not just the ability to think, but the, the ability to think about what we're thinking about, right? The ability to evaluate our thoughts. And we have the ability to turn from focus on everything outside, inward, to what it is that we're thinking, to self-evaluate what it is that we're thinking. Just like that chart showed, thoughts are at the foundation When you and I start messing around with the foundation, things happen. Things get kicked up. The title of this series is not, Boy, It Would Be Great If You Could Shave Off Some of the Rough Edges of Your Thoughts. And it's not, Gee, It Would Be Swell If You Could Take a Look at Your Positive Thoughts and Your Negative Thoughts and Just Have a Couple More Positive Thoughts, right? It's called Transform. God wants to transform you into a new person. And when that happens things happen. I don't want anyone to have rose-colored glasses on, eyes wide open. I've been dealing with some things myself this month and this week particularly, physical things. I know many of you have as well, spiritual things. Get the attention of the enemy who would like nothing, nothing more than to get you off track, get you distracted, think there's so many other things you could be doing with your time, not just on Sunday mornings, but every time. We're talking today about God thoughts. God thoughts. This will kick up some things in your life. Your brain is one of the greatest assets that God's given to us. 
Just think about that for a moment. You know? When we decide, I'm going to stay here, this brain that neuroscientists say we don't know a lot about, this brain that neuroscientists say we're only using a small percentage of, this brain that God created amidst all other organs and systems and stuff in his geniusness. And when we decide to stay here, we're saying, God, you're not bigger than my pain. It's going to kick up some stuff. We've looked throughout this series at several places where God has identified what he's thinking. I'm talking today about God thoughts. Here's another one. In Jeremiah 29, 11, 12, and 13. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of, there's that word again, peace. God's peace that transcends our understanding. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. What God's saying here in Jeremiah is that when our thoughts are focused on God's truth, when we choose God's truth to counteract the lies of our past, the strongholds that's offered by the world, then we are full of peace and hope. The problem is that when we're focused on things that make us anxious and make us worried and make us fearful, our thoughts tend to go in a direction that doesn't please God and does not good for ourselves. Why is it that when we think about things that make us anxious, that make us worried, that make us fearful, it's almost as if our brains tend to double down, right? Those, those neural pathways for fearful thoughts and worried thoughts and anxious thoughts, it's almost as if our brain seems to compound the fear and the worry and the anxiety. Why is that? Well, again, just bringing a little science into here because it all comes from God. There's a little portion of our brain. It's the size of an almond, and it's called the amygdala. Everyone say that, amygdala. It's a fun word to say, amygdala. It's the part of the brain that's responsible for fear and is hardwired for survival. Whenever we're in a fearful situation, it is the amygdala that kicks into full gear. It is a very helpful part of the brain, that's wired to make us afraid so that we'll get out of a situation or a circumstance that would otherwise be hurtful or harmful to us. Like, perhaps, for example, when we come upon a dangerous situation. Perhaps a situation like, for example, when we come upon a snake. And not any old snake. Maybe a really dangerous-looking snake. And not just any dangerous-looking snake. A really big, dangerous-looking snake. And not just any old, really big, dangerous-looking snake, but a really big, dangerous-looking snake that has now just locked its eyes on you. Maybe something like this. Sometimes being up here is more fun than any one person should be allowed to have. (laughs) The looks on some of your faces. It is the amygdala that sends strong doses of adrenaline throughout your body, like some of you right there. And the amygdala is not objective. It has one role. It has one function and that is to protect. It is hardwired for your survival. That is why the amygdala needs help from another part of your body called the, another part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that's logical and rational. Uh, This is the part that's used in planning and decision making and personality expression. This is the part of the brain that kicks in particularly 
when the amygdala starts to go out of control, like in that video, right? As the camera panned along the length of the really big, dangerous-looking boa constrictor's body, your amygdala, like I said, starts to kick in. It starts to release adrenaline throughout your body. And it starts to say things like this. Oh, no. Snakes are bad. Big snakes are really bad. Look away. I don't want to see this. Oh, no. Some of you guys were covering your eyes. Some of your heads were going down. Your shoulders are going like a frightened turtle. That's what the amygdala says, right? It says, get away. Look away. Oh, no. What was that on the floor? Something just moved. Oh, no, no. If you allow the amygdala to go out of control, that's what it'll do. It, it has, it's hardwired. It is not objective. It has one role. It is for survival. Meanwhile, your prefrontal cortex kicks in, and while that video was being played, after it realizes the amygdala is activated, it says to you things like this. Dude, breathe. It's okay. Just a video played on a screen all the way over here. You're all the way over there. Pastor Andy would not do anything that would hurt you. And that thing on the ground was just a string. It's not a snake. It's not. <laughs> At our house growing up, you know, when I was a kid, mom and dad's house, it was about less than two miles away from a gun club and less than five miles away from our local county airport. So for us to hear small arms fire in the distance or to hear small aircraft flying, we seem to be right on the flight pan, plan, so right over our house, our amygdala and our prefrontal cortex rectified that, right? Objectively said, this is where you live. This is what this is. This is a, a gun club. And occasionally there may be a big event at the gun club. You hear more rapid fire or louder fire. Or occasionally we had Stewart Air Force Base nearby. Some larger aircraft would fly by. But for the most part, our prefrontal cortex in our family would rationally, objectively explain the sounds that we heard. It was fun, however, when we had friends to come over <laughs> because they thought we were being invaded. <laughs> and the invaders had ammunition and small aircraft flying overhead. Uh, when Suzanne and I were first getting together, she would joke uh, every now and again about uh, white vans. Um, not to go near white vans. You know, not, not like minivans, but you know, those white commercial vans that are windowless often. And I always, you know, we kind of joked about it, right? And it didn't, you know, I, I, I saw it as a combination of like bad movie scenes, right? Horror films or something where bad things happen at the hands of a driver of a white van. And so, but I realized over time, actually as a child, she had a fairly traumatic event. When her family lived in New Jersey, uh, they lived on a side road right off of a main road. And one day, Next door neighbor was a grandmother, had her granddaughter over for the day, about eight years old. And uh, the grandmother went in the house for a minute. And so the granddaughter's playing outside, and just then a white van pulled up in front of the house. And the driver started talking to the little girl, and then got out of the van and tried to pick her up. And then the grandmother came running out of the house, and the man put the child down and drove away quickly. And then they came over to Suzanne's house and spent some time together. And this was a traumatic event, especially for a child. See adults, you know, obviously, understandably, upset and hysterical about what had just happened. The amygdala kicked in, and then over time, the prefrontal cortex rationalizes it. There's remnants there. Um, I'll, I'll apologize to any of you that may drive a white commercial van. The Salinos are probably not going to park next to you. <laughs> but for the most part, it's a, we laugh about it. What's the takeaway from this? Because of the experiences that many of us have had, strong amygdala responses to triggers, past pain, past trauma, past guilt, past grief, many of our hard drives are hardwired. We've allowed our hard drives to become hardwired, to protect, to hunker down, we see something or someone says something and it triggers. It triggers us into paths of worry and of fear and of unhealthy thinking. So we are more focused upon and the voice that we hear often is the loudest, 
towards self-preservation and not towards the fullness and the hope and the peace that God desires for us. Paul's speaking to the church in Philippi, and he says this, Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and by petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the, there's that word again, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Praying heals. And foundationally, prayer heals the mind. Prayer renews the brain. Prayer changes the way that we think. Although all of us have been guilty of this at some point or another, prayer is never our last resort. Prayer is never our last line of defense, as I shared last week. It's not the protection and the preventative and the holding off of the pain so it doesn't infiltrate my life. No. The weapons of our warfare are not the world's. They're mighty. And they're powerful. Pull down strongholds to eliminate proud obstacles and to hold every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Another neuroscientist I've been following. Uh, she's a cognitive neuroscientist from South Africa and a Christian. And her name is Dr. Caroline Leaf. And her passion is to help people see the connection between science and God, particularly in relationship to this topic we've been talking about, how to change the way that we think. And she said this in her book, Switch On Your Brain. She said, it's been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change your brain to such an extent that the change can be measured in a brain scan. I mentioned last week, talking about meditation, frequent, no legalistic answer. And those of you that may have come from a legalistic background went, ah, okay. no magical number of minutes, just frequent, consistent, daily, regular time with God. For those of you that are type A and need lists and programs, Dr. Caroline leaves for you, right? 12 minutes daily over an eight-week period can change our brains. It's possible. Like I said earlier, this brain that we know relatively so little about, that scientists in my lifetime, and this isn't just little minor changes. This is like earth is flat, earth is round kind of things. You know, brain is fixed. No, brain is dynamic. Brain is plasticity, has plasticity, right? I, I grew up with some of those terms, learned them in science thought they were around for hundreds of years, realized, no, it's only in the last few decades. Science has gotten to this point with this magical tissue of ours, this organ that we know so little about, that we only use a percentage of. And God says, I want to transform you into new people. And it's possible to change the way that you think. The problem is that when our worry and our anxiety get out of control. This is what the scientific community calls an amygdala hijack. It's when we give in to our fear and to our worry. This can present ourselves when we're always fearful, when we live lives that are worried, and when we're seemingly anxious about everything. Our amygdala takes over, and it's the part of the brain that we are predominantly hearing. It says things like, survive. You need to survive. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anyone. Survive. Hunker down. Don't worry about praying. It's not going to change it anyway. Things are bad. And they're not going to get any better. They're only going to get worse. Save yourself. When the amygdala is the voice that you and I hear the most, our minds become dominated by sin. Remember Paul, in week one, we took a look at If you allow the worldly nature, the worldly wisdom, the sinful nature to control your minds, it leads to death. If you allow the spirit to control your mind, 
it leads to life and peace. The, the control for your thoughts is under your control. But when we allow the amygdala to be the predominant voice that we hear, we have now opened the door to sinful thoughts, to allow sinful thoughts to dominate our thinking. Because again, we're saying, God, you're not big enough. Yes, you created this. Yes, we don't know a lot about this brain, but you're not big enough to, to overcome my grief, to overcome the abuse I've suffered, to overcome the trauma I've experienced. You're not big enough. Paul says, instead of allowing your sinful nature to control your mind that leads to death, Paul's encouraging us to choose to allow the logical part of our brain to choose that which is spiritual. To allow the logical part of our brain. Instead of allowing the hunker down, survive, save yourself, nothing's going to work, part of your brain to dictate your feelings and your emotions and your words and your actions and the course of your life, Paul's encouraging us to choose to allow the logical part of our brain to choose that which is spiritual, to choose that which is eternal, to allow the logical part of our brain to choose that which God says is true. Paul says to the church in Rome, Romans 8, 5, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. I want to share with you, because I've shared with you, um, some of the evolution of my thought process and some of the things that I had to learn. I shared with you last week that my parents, like many around me, raised my siblings and I with the idea that there's nothing we can't accomplish if we put our minds to it. There's nothing that we can't achieve if we work hard enough and think smart enough. And because of that, my default zone is sometimes, I have to guard against it, is that I'll fall back into that. My default zone, you know, when, when I asked in week one how many people have conflicts between the thoughts they want to have and the thoughts that they oftentimes do have, most everybody's hand was up. Mine was too. And so again, I share this with you, hopefully to encourage you, that if I'm not careful, I will slip back into that default zone of, I'm doing this. I'm accomplishing this. I'm achieving this goal. And if I'm not careful, I'll only invite God into the situation when I have difficulty achieving it. And so, one of the things that I do, some form or fashion of this, at the start of every day, but variations of this throughout the day, is I speak God thoughts over my life. And I want to share it with you. I say, God, I know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I know I'm a child of the one true king. I know the number of hairs on my head are numbered by you. You love me so unconditionally and know me so intimately. I know that before I knew my mom or another, another living person or even knew you, you knew me and you chose me and you loved me and you gifted me, and you put a plan and a purpose written for my life. I know because of your unconditional love for me, I'm valued. Because of the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross for me, I'm saved. Because of the power and the guidance, the counsel of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, I'm led. But Lord, I need you. I am not all that in a bag of chips. I'm dependent upon you. 
Enlarge my heart. Increase my faith in you so that my words and my actions will honor you and I'll look more and I'll sound more and I'll react more like your son, my Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to encourage all of you to get your God thoughts and I want to encourage you to speak them over your life, not just when the you-know-what hits the fan, but at the start of every day, regularly, consistently, frequently. I want to encourage you to have the truth of God's word overwhelm the lies of the enemy, to overwhelm the strongholds of this world that would keep otherwise keep you from going in and receiving what he's promised you, a future that's full of hope and peace. I want to share with you a few. Invite you to write them down. Invite you to take your cameras and take pictures of the screen. Invite you to put them into your words. And to stick them on your fridge if you're a magnet person. Get them in here. Not recited perfectly, grammatically correct. Get them in here. First one is this. I am not my past. I am not what I did. I am who God says I am. And he says I'm forgiven. He says that I'm redeemed. He says that I'm free. I am not a hostage to unhealthy thoughts. The weapons I fight with are not the weapons of this world. I have divine power to demolish strongholds. I have the mind of Christ directing my thoughts. I have the word of God guiding my steps. I demolish every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And I take every thought captive and I make it obedient to Christ. Worry is not my master. I trust in God. My God rescued me. My God delivered me. My God promised me. My God is good. This land is good. Exceedingly good. My God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I am not a slave to my habits. I am not a prisoner to addiction. I have been rescued from the power of darkness and I have been brought into the kingdom of God's light. My God is for me. My God is with me. and No weapon formed against me will prosper. And I am not what I have and I am not what I buy. My identity is in Christ and Christ alone. Finally, this, by God's power, I can change. By God's power, I can change. I say these things so that in me, you may have peace. It's not easy. They're bigger than us. They're stronger than us. It's not easy. It's not easy to stay in something that you know is not God's best. But it's what you know. It's what's been known to you. It's what's been spoken over you, maybe by key people in your life. It's what's been done to you. It's been how you've been made to feel. But by God's power, you and I can change. And God's desire is to change you, transform you, into a new person, a 
person it's radically different because you think new because you change the way you think i want to ask you to stand with me